Patrice Cullors, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. Thanks for having me back. As, as one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, as we know it, you are no stranger to just the huge amounts of pushback any slogan can get. And so when you, when you came out with defund the police, more recently, you have started talking more about divesting from the police. Is there a reason that you changed or are starting to move away from defund to divest? And how does that tie into the Breathe Act that I believe you're working on? Yes, I mean, for us, uh, the defund movement uh, will be the ultimate slogan of this movement. Uh, we're not going to step away from that. But we've been talking about divesting out of the police for a very long time. And it's just now that it's been popularized. It's, it's in this moment in which people are truly questioning the role of police. The Breathe Act, which is modern day, the modern day civil rights legislation of our time is right. looking at how do we not just talk about divesting or defunding from the police, but what does it look like to reinvest into our communities, into social services, into um, people having access to adequate public education, people having access to adequate health care, people having access to adequate healthy food. Let's stop divesting, let's stop investing all of our dollars into the police and the criminal legal system, and let's actually invest into into human care, into dignity, into the into life for human beings. I have done extensive reading on, you know, reforming the police. I've done extensive reading on uh, divesting from the police, defunding the police, all these different measures that people have 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 proposed in different ways. How do you go from a world of police for everything? to no police or to police for only a few things, but not have that messy period in the middle where crime just goes up? I think there's a number of ways to do this. Um, many of us uh, that are part of the defund movement or even the abolitionist movement are not actually saying that this can happen overnight. We know there needs to be phases. Phase one of the plan, which is what are the first few things we can decriminalize that we can make no longer illegal? Um, I would say homelessness. Um, I would say drug and alcohol addiction, mm -hmm. um, and I would say mental health um, crisis. And so if we start with just those three pillars of de decriminalizing them or making them fully legal, then we can actually start by, okay, what do we do with the homeless population since we're not going to be investing the police to deal with them? Oh, we can get them housing. How does right, that work? Right. But I would really push that this is where elected officials come in. Congress, the Senate, our local elected city council, county board of supervisors must work with the community to build a plan to phase us out of over-policing. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is the term defund the police is not so much get rid of this thing right now. It's start building towards... It's That's starting exactly. to build towards something. The same way, you know, when the president of the United States said, we're going to put a man on the moon, he didn't say, we're going to build a rocket and then we're going to build a station for the rocket to launch from, and then we're going to build... It was like, this is the end goal of what we're going That's to do. Right. Let's start the journey today. Okay. That's exactly right. Let's talk a little bit about your book. You are a best-selling author, and it's entitled When They Call You a Terrorist, A Story of Black Lives Matter and the Power to Change the World. Your, your memoir is really touching because you don't just talk about activism. You talk about your life and how you got into activism. I was really touched by how you talk about how you grew up in a Jehovah's Witness family, and you talk about how your mother was kicked out of the house for being pregnant at 16, and then you talk about how later on you were then shunned by your family for coming out as queer. Do you think that that has imbued within yourself an affinity for all those groups of people who are marginalized in society? Absolutely. I feel deeply connected to, uh, say, the underdog, to marginalized communities, because I lived it firsthand as a young person growing up in a working class, poor family, witnessing my single mom have to really be a single mother mm -hmm. and not get the support, um, not just from her family, but also not get the support from the state, uh, from the government, um, and witnessing my, fa my, my father and my brother be in and out of prison. Um, I think that really impacted me both personally but once I became an activist, I realized, oh, this is a much bigger system and I can shape that system and I can be a part of a movement that shapes that system. Before I let you go, 
there's one major issue that is going to affect the election in November. And that is how people perceive the protests that are taking place in the streets. You know, Fox News and conservative media have done a really good job of framing this as an anarchist society where people are gonna go around burning everything in the streets and that's what Black Lives Matter is about. I've always been interested in why yourself and your fellow co-founders of Black Lives Matter haven't said, you know what, I'm gonna be the leader, front face leader of this movement and speak to what Black Lives, Black Lives Matter would or wouldn't be doing. Is there a reason you've shied away from this? We didn't become the leaders because we designated ourselves as the leaders. We became the leaders because people said, oh, these three women started this thing and they must be the leaders. I do think with the protests in particular, we believe that people have the right, the constitutional right to protest. And protest is not just here in this country. We've seen people across the globe stand up and protest. The Black Lives Matter organization believes in nonviolent protests. We also believe that people are angry and hurt and um, are trying to figure out when is this government going to finally listen to us. We also know that oftentimes what happens inside protests are not always what they seem. Right, it's right. It's always Black Lives Matter protesters burning up a building. Sometimes and often it's agent provocateurs. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we've been very careful about how we talk about the protests because we don't truly know who is doing what. Right, um, right. And it's important that we stay on message about what we want. We want to defund the police. We want to invest in social services. We want the Breathe Act passed. And we want to make sure that our government treats Black people as human beings. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And uh, good luck with the rest of the journey. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.